you'll never be able to change that. That's a hopeless cause. Concentrate on things you can change, not on the things you can't. Be realistic. People working for social change hear these words all the time. What I want to talk about today is to say, in the words of the old 1960s slogan, it's important to be realistic and demand the impossible. I want to talk about it with regard to this question of East Timor. This is a small country in Southeast Asia of some one million people. In 1975, it was invaded and occupied by the armed forces of Indonesia, the regional giant, the country next door. Under Indonesian rule, at least 100,000 people, up to one-third of the population perhaps, died. During war, famine, a near genocide, a litany of human rights violations. The world said, a tiny country, it's better to give up, it's better to accept Indonesian rule. But the slogan that was used by so many Timorese people throughout the 24 years of Indonesian military occupation of their country was, to resist is to win. If we go on fighting, if we survive as a people, then in the end, we will have won the day. We will win out. This is despite the fact that Indonesia was so much stronger, so much larger, and so much more supported internationally by all of the major powers in the international community. The United States, Japan, Britain, France, Germany, Canada. Despite the fact that, in one instance, the Indonesian armed forces dropped napalm on Timorese civilians, napalm supplied by the Soviet Union dropped from aircraft supplied by the United States, a rare example during the Cold War of superpower cooperation. Even so, they said, we have to fight on. In 1999, they did win. East Timor gained its independence in a referendum in which close to 80% of the people voted for independence. And despite efforts by the Indonesian military to derail that vote, that result, the uh, results were respected, and East Timor became the first independent country of the 21st century. So where is East Timor? The story told by many of the indigenous peoples of East Timor, of which there are several, is that the island of Timor was born on the back of a crocodile. One day, a boy saved a baby crocodile from drowning. The boy and the crocodile became friends. They traveled the world. They had many adventures. When it was time for the crocodile to die, he decided not to sink beneath the waves and give up his life, but rather to become an island, to shelter the boy and the other human people. The island became Timor, a small country, as I've said, between the Asian mainland and Australia, colonized first by Portugal and then, after 1975, by Indonesia. There's another story. The Mumbai people in the, in the highlands overlooking the Timorese capital of Dili tell this story. In the beginning, Father Sky and Mother Earth created the world. In the beginning, everything could speak. The animals could speak to people and to each other. The trees could cry out. Even the rocks had voices. But this caused some trouble for the people. You couldn't kill an animal if it spoke to you. You couldn't chop down a tree if it cried out in pain when the axe hit it. And so the people went to Father Sky and they said, can you make the rocks and the animals and the trees fall silent? And Father Sky agreed, but he had a condition. His condition was that if I make the animals and the rocks and the trees silent mouths, then you must become speaking mouths. You must speak out for them. That is your responsibility. After 1975, after their country was invaded, the Timorese were forced to become silent. The world didn't know what was happening. If they did, they did nothing. I'm going to show a couple of photographs from Elaine Briere, a young Canadian photojournalist who traveled to East Timor shortly before the invasion. Her photographs of the pre-invasion Timorese indigenous cultures became one of the last records. 
They didn't, and she didn't try to speak on behalf of the Timorese, but the photographs, in some ways, became images, became speaking mouths on behalf of the Timorese. This was the effort. So what happened? What did, how did the world respond to the military occupation of East Timor? I have a quote up here. In our view, incorporation is an established and irreversible fact. This is the view of the Canadian Department of External Affairs. It's not that anyone hated the Timorese or anything like that, but, they said, annexation, Indonesian rule, is inevitable, nothing can be done about it, and therefore nothing should be done about it, no one should even try. In response to that, many Timorese said to resist is to win. If we fight on, we will in the end win. If we survive, we will win. Some Canadians agreed. I have a quotation up here from a member of the Nova Scotia East Timor Group, the first East Timor human rights organization in Canada. The occupation of East Timor is brutal and illegal, she wrote, but I don't believe it is irreversible. Canadian governments did feel it was irreversible. Pierre Trudeau met with the Indonesian president, General Suharto, shortly before the invasion of East Timor. He came to Ottawa. East Timor is the only issue that Suharto raised, and he implied that Indonesia was planning to take it over. If no one objected, Pierre Trudeau did not object. No one in Canada objected. A few years later, Trudeau visited Jakarta. East Timor, he said, had raised the question of the self-determination of peoples, but Canada had decided that stability of the region should be foremost, and thus had supported Indonesia. This was the stance of Canadian governments for most of the 24 years that followed the invasion. I first heard about East Timor in 1985. I was an undergraduate student in my first year at Trent University, trying to decide what to major in. I saw this image. This is another of Elaine Briere's photographs from East Timor shortly before the invasion, of a young woman coming home from the fields carrying corn on her head. Her eyes seemed to speak to me and say, you have to come and hear about what's being talked about. And what was being talked about is a young Canadian activist Julia Morrigan uh, was giving a talk about East Timor. And I went to the talk, I listened to the talk, I learned about the situation, and I asked Julia afterwards, well, what's Canada doing to help? She said, well, nothing. Um, actually, Canada is supporting the human rights violators. And it turned out Canada was a major economic supporter, a major diplomatic supporter, and even a major military supporter by selling arms of Indonesia. So even though it was a hopeless cause, Along with many others, I got involved in what became the East Timor Alert Network, the national campaign organization of Canadians working for the human rights and the right to independence of the Timorese people. We are all responsible, the organization said. East Timor is a Canadian issue. Canada should have something to say. For many years, Canada had very little to say. This began to change in 1991. These are images from the Santa Cruz Massacre. In 1991, a group of several thousand Timorese, mostly young people, were walking through the streets of the capital city, Dili, to walk to the grave of Sebastian Gomez, a young Timorese pro-independence activist who had recently been killed at the hands of the Indonesian security forces. As they walked through the streets, there was a celebratory atmosphere, and more and more people came out to join them. People from the high schools, people from the elementary schools joined in the walk. When they arrived at the cemetery, Indonesian soldiers were there. They opened fire on the crowd of unarmed protesters, and they killed some 250 people and injured many more. This was nothing new. This was a massacre like so many massacres before it. But one thing was new, which was that there were some Western reporters present. It made it real. Journalists filmed, watched, witnessed what was happening. The footage screened around the world, including on the CBC News. People began to hear about it. People began to notice. Silences began to be broken. They began to be broken, most of all, by 
the arrival of two Timorese refugees in Canada. And these are the real change makers. These were Abbe Barreto Suarez, who's seen here singing for his country, and Belia Galios, who's showing photographs of people in her country being tortured. They arrived in Canada, the best and the brightest, handpicked by the Indonesian authorities as young, loyal Timorese. When they arrived in Canada, they defected. They dropped out of university. They gave up potentially lucrative careers to live in poverty and campaign for the human rights of their people. I had the rare privilege of being able to work with these and other activists during their time in Canada. They're both back in, their, in Timor now, independent country, doing important work. They worked a lot with a lot of students. 1997, University of British Columbia. President Suharto of Indonesia was one of the leaders visiting to attend the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, summit. I was a grad student at UBC at the time. Student protesters mobilized to try to have a citizen's arrest of Suharto for crimes against humanity. This was their effort. They were stopped by the RCMP. The RCMP also, using pepper spray, cleared the roads so that President Suharto's motorcade could speed by from UBC to Vancouver Airport without having to be confronted with the sight of protesters, not even to have to see them. Well, a year later, Suharto was out of power. Student protesters and others toppled him in Indonesia. His successor agreed to a referendum in East Timor to allow them to choose between Indonesian rule and independence. The vote, 78.5% for independence, on a turnout of 98% of the people, an overwhelming result. East Timor gained its independence. To resist had been to win. A few years ago, I had a rather special opportunity. I got to uh, travel to East Timor, not for the first time, but for a particularly um, interesting visit, to accept the Order of East Timor on behalf of the East Timor Alert Network, the organization being honored for its years of support. I had this surreal experience while I was there. So I'm sitting in the st uh, stage, looking out at the incredibly bright sun of Maliana, the village where this uh, ceremony is taking place. And I'm looking up at the mountains and saying, this is mountains where not too long ago, guerrillas were fighting against the Indonesian soldiers occupying their country. Now, here I was at the bottom of the mountain, receiving a medal from one of those guerrillas, Tower Matan Ruak, who had become, by this point, the president of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. It really was the impossible coming true. There's no such thing as a lost cause. And I think East Timor proves it. It proves that it's happening. It proves you can make change. Now, East Timor is not perfect. It is the most democratic country in Southeast Asia. It's the poorest country in Southeast Asia. It's on a good path but there are certainly trebles. One of them was identified recently by the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which stated that amongst its recommendations, reparations should be paid to Timorese victims by some of the governments, including Canada's, that had made the tragedy possible by supplying the Indonesian military regime with the means, indeed the weapons, to carry out these killings. I asked the U.S. ambassador to East Timor about this a couple of years ago, and he said, well, it's nothing to do with us. We're not responsible. And he implied that nothing could be done. There was no point even trying. I don't think that's the case. I think that the case of East Timor does show that it's worth taking on these hopeless causes. It's worth fighting for these hopeless causes. It's worth standing, if you can, in solidarity with the people who are really taking the lead on these causes. And above all, there aren't any lost causes in international affairs or anything else. No lost causes. And don't let anyone tell you different. That's it.